In 1843, Dickens was horrified uh, by reading uh, a government report. It was in fact the second uh, parliamentary report, the Parliamentary Commission on the Employment of Women and Children, showing the horrific conditions under which very young children uh, were made to work underground or to work tremendously long hours in, in appalling conditions in factories. Dickens read this and he described himself uh, as being perfectly stricken down by it and he determined that he would strike, as he said, the heaviest blow in my power uh, on behalf uh, of, these, uh, of these victims of the Industrial Revolution. And in October 1843 he was giving a talk in Manchester it was in the course of giving this talk in this large industrial city that the idea came to him that the best thing he could do by way of calling public attention to the, the, the horror of this report would be by writing a story rather than an article. Something that would strike the heaviest blow in my power, as he said, something that would come down with sledgehammer force. And this was the conception of the Christmas Carol, beginning, of course, with the conception uh, of Scrooge, that wonderful name Scrooge, a combination of screw and gouge. The idea of Scrooge as the ultimate miser, the ultimate loner, uh, who had no uh, feelings uh, for uh, the rest of humanity except as to what, how much money he could make out of them. Then uh, he had the, the concept of the three spirits, the spirits of Christmas past, Christmas present and Christmas future, by which in one night, uh, the night of Christmas Eve, Scrooge was to be converted uh, from his extreme misanthropy uh, to great benevolence and, and love of humanity. Scrooge is visited by three ghosts. The ghost of Christmas past takes him back into his childhood um, and his young manhood, um, shows him uh, the suffering that he himself underwent as a child. There's a particularly poignant scene where he's, he's left alone in this barren, horrible schoolroom, where well, all the other children have gone home for the Christmas holidays. And Dickens writes, Scrooge sat down and wept to see him, his former self, as he had used to be. He begins with pity uh, for himself. Then he's shown further visions which make him very uncomfortable about his past, uh, his engagement to a beautiful young girl, and then the girl breaking off the engagement. And Scrooge, in the present, as it were, is horrified uh, to see himself becoming in the past more and more uh, miserly. Then the, the second visitor is the ghost of Christmas present, this great jolly giant uh, sitting on a great mound of turkeys and Christmas puddings and so forth. And he shows Scrooge the home life of his own poor clerk, whom he pays starvation wages to, 15 shillings a week, and Bob Cratchit uh, has to keep his family of several children, including, of course, the crippled child, Tiny Tim, and he has to keep them on this meagre wage. But the Ghost of Christmas Present shows Scrooge the family happiness at Christmas, and Scrooge is, is shown even uh, Bob Cratchit, uh, who is a very devoted and faithful employee despite the terrible way Scrooge treats him, even raises a glass to toast Mr. Scrooge. Scrooge is particularly concerned with the crippled child, Tiny Tim, and he says to the ghost of Christmas Present, tell me if Tiny Tim will live, and the ghost of Christmas Present says, well, if things don't change, then he will not be here for another Christmas, he, he will die. And Scrooge is, is filled uh, with pity. He has this nostalgia, first of all, about his own past, and before he became corrupt, as it were, 
then pity for the Cratchits in the present. And then the third and most, uh, the, the most frightening, of course, of the ghosts, the one who doesn't speak, is the ghost of Christmas yet to come. This dark shadow uh, who shows Scrooge visions of the horrible, bleak, desolate death uh, of an unnamed man who has, has cut himself off from all humanity and dies in solitude and is buried in a very horrible grave in a London churchyard. And Scrooge is made to read the um, name on that tombstone, which of course is Scrooge. So the third great component is fear. So there's nostalgia, pity and fear. And these things work on Scrooge to convert him so that when he wakes up the next morning, uh, it hasn't been three different nights as he thinks, it's all happened in one night. Uh, he has been converted, of course, from uh, this horrible old miser to uh, one of the most benevolent and uh, loving and outgoing of all possible human beings. And uh, this is the very well-known story uh, of the Christmas Carol, which gives us this wonderful story about change, how we can all change and become something much, much better. Dickens said that he composed it in a kind of frenzy, walking about the black streets of London night after night, composing this story in, in his mind, getting it written uh, in time for publication just immediately after Christmas 1843. He wanted it uh, to be a very attractive little book. So he wanted his publishers to spare no expense. This included coloured illustrations, hand-painted illustrations, which was, of course, enormously expensive. Uh, so that there was a contradiction there. I mean, Dickens wanted the book uh, to reach the poorest readers, but it would be impossible for the publishers to publish it uh, at less than five shillings, which was an enormous sum, uh, of course, for a, a working class family to afford. Uh, the illustrator was the very distinguished and famous artist John Leach, uh, who was the leading illustrator on the great comic magazine Punch and a very, very close friend uh, of Dickens. One of the most powerful illustrations uh, is the illustration of the terrible children. Uh, they're just called Ignorance and Want, with whom the Ghost of Christmas Present confronts Scrooge uh, at the end of that section of the carol, just before the Ghost of Christmas Present, having shown him the Cratchit's dinner, uh, having shown him all the, the happiness and, and joy uh, of his nephew's Christmas party. The ghost of Christmas present is about to leave him uh, when he notices these, these rather claw-like feet, skin and bone as it were, sticking out from the, under the robes of the ghost, uh, who then reveals these two terrible children, wolfish, scowling, desperate. The ghost of Christmas present tells Scrooge, beware of these children and all of their degree. Uh, he's hinting at some terrible outbreak of revolution and so on. Uh, and this was very much a fear of, of the 1840s, the hungry 40s as they were known, that there might occur in England some kind of revolution as there had occurred in France in the previous century. And what is very interesting is that uh, Leach, this is not in the text, he adds this himself, the background to this scene where Scrooge confronts these two children is factory chimneys, factories. The scene's supposed to take place in London, not in Manchester. But Leach, mindful, I suppose, or having talked to Dickens about the, the horror of the report of the um, exploitation of children in mines and manufactories, does have these factory chimneys behind, which is in, in this scene, uh, which is very telling, I think. Anyway, the, the, uh, uh, the, the thing was written in just a few weeks and it was published, uh, sold out uh, immediately and was a huge, huge success. It was reviewed everywhere and universally praised. 
Thackeray, Dickens's great rival as a novelist, said uh, in his review of The Christmas Carol, it seems to me a national benefit and to every man and woman who reads it, a personal kindness. It sold one edition after another. Um, of course, was put on the stage. Uh, Dickens couldn't control this. I mean, there was no copyright protection uh, in those days, so that dramatists were free to seize on the work of, of novelists and turn them into plays and put them on the stage. And I think there were uh, about five different versions of the carol running at the uh, at different London theatres uh, within weeks uh, of the publication. He had hoped that the carol would earn him a great deal of money, but uh, in fact the costs of production were so enormous that his profit in the end was very little. He could do nothing to stop the pirates uh, who he tried. He went to law to stop the um, pirated versions of the carol, uh, but because copyright laws were so weak in those days, uh, he couldn't do anything about it and um, he lost the case. Uh, and as I've said before, he couldn't do anything about all the dramatizations. So he had the mortification of seeing lots and lots of people making lots and lots of money out of the carol, but he himself uh, not uh, at all making as much as he thought. However, uh, it did hugely increase the intensity uh, of that love affair that was you know, the most uh, important in Dickens's life. Uh, that love affair between himself and his public, that relationship that he called personally affectionate and like no other man's. Uh, and the carol contributed hugely, of course, to this. Mm -hmm.